Hey, listener, this is Ben from the show. I just want to chime in real quick and thank you for listening and also to apologize in advance if the first few episodes aren't that well polished. I promise they'll get better in the future as we figure out what we're doing. Also, we love geese and Brits. Thanks again and enjoy the show. Today we are talking about toilet paper. Got anything to say about toilet paper? I like it. That's it? That's all you gotta say about toilet paper? Well, you know, something like toilet paper is pretty insignificant. What could there possibly be to say about toilet paper? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because boy, do I have a lot to say about toilet paper. Do tell. Toilet paper, I guess let's, co- let's cover the basics first of what toilet paper is. Toilet paper is a product made of pulp. Yeah, like in my orange juice. No, not, no, that's, that's no. Same, I mean, basic thing? concept, yes, but oh. it's wood pulp. Or previously recycled paper pulp. Uh, Water and chlorine, or bleach, primarily used for hygiene purposes. There are other uses, of course, for toilet paper as, like, vandalism. You know, toilet papering, toilet papering houses. TPing, if you will. Mm Mm-hmm. The bundle, like the bundle that it comes on, is uh, called a toilet paper roll, or a loo roll, or a bog roll. The British, the Brits. Ew. Brits call it a bog roll. There are different plies from one to six, and of course, the long debated over or under. Which is, should be over. Always over. I don't know, because, you know, like if you have a cat and they like to paw at it and then make a big pile on the floor, that's not ideal. If you have it under, it'll just keep going around and around. I hear you and the words that you're saying, but, uh, over. We'll we'll get we'll get more into that. Let's go way back. Let's let's go to the the beginning of the the wonderful bond of paper and butts. I'm transporting. Mm-hmm. Meet me in sixth century China. Oof! I'll try, but my aim isn't that great. We'll see. <laughs> uh, paper for hygiene has been recorded as early as 589, when the scholar Yan Zhitui, which I hope I said that right. He lived from 531 to 591, and he had some thoughts on on paper. He has a quote here, paper on which there are quotations or commentary from the five classics or the names of sages I dare not use for toilet purposes. So he was very particular about the type of paper that he put on his butt. He, you know, he didn't want to wipe his butt with poems. That, that's, that's, that's commendable. Show some respect. During the 14th century, 1393, an annual supply of 720,000 sheets of toilet paper were manufactured for the general use of the imperial court. Can you guess how big these sheets of paper were? I cannot fathom. They, Yeah, they were two foot by three foot sheets of perfumed paper. Two foot by three foot sheets of paper that had been perfumed so like a very large tile so they just like had towels of paper for their butts Mm -hmm. how fancy how royal it perfumed Ooh, they were living it up uh well elsewhere wealthy people wiped themselves with wool or lace or hemp while less wealthy people basically used anything that they could get their hands on. Like, I have a list here of wood shavings, leaves, grass, hay, stone, sand, moss, snow, ferns, plant husks, fruit skins, seashells, corn cobs. Sometimes they would just go in a river and then, like, wipe themselves with their hands and let it, let the river clean them. Of all those options, that sounds like the best thing. Yeah, that's the one that I would pick. They're so gritty. Oh, I don't like that word, gritty. gritty. Sand, seashells, wood chips. Corn cobs. So gritty. Corn cobs are a, are a favorite. In ancient Rome, a sponge on a stick called a xylospongium was used to wipe the bottom, as in their bottoms, their Which bums. Is a, a really cool name for that. Xylospongium? Oh, yeah should name all kinds of things xylospongium. Sounds like a 
disease or like a bacteria. Got a bad case of the xylospongium. Which no, leads me case. to my next point. <laughs> they So the stick that had the xylospongium on it was placed back in a bucket of water and like vinegar and salt. And then these sponges were used communally in public latrines. Mm. Which, as you can imagine, is a breeding ground for bacteria, which led to a lot of diseases. In ancient Greece, small pebbles or pieces of pottery with smooth edges were used to scrape themselves clean. Um, some historians think that pe- that they, they would write like the names of their enemies on the stone and then wipe themselves with it. Which I think is like the ultimate diss. That's pretty bad. Your homeboy go into his bathroom and find your name written on a stone. I just have to assume that after they were done, they like put it in a satchel and then like threw it at him or her. That is so much worse. <laughs> also, you'd have to carry that around. Like, oh, I just pooped. Now I'm going to carry this poop rock. Just with Jeffrey's name on it. Just you wait, Jeffrey. When I see you, this stone is going your way. Um, so in England, for nearly 500 years, the kings and queens of England had a special servant that was titled the groom of the stool or the first lady of the bedchamber, depending on on the gender of the person that had the job. I must say, first lady of the bedchamber sounds a lot better than, what What was the other option? The groom of the stool. The groom of the stool. I, I don't know. There, there's a really good wordplay going on there with, with the groom of the stool. Stool, and then they sat on stools, and then like poop of stool. At least if you're the groom of the stool, you could just be like, uh, they come up to you and they're like, hey, what do you do for a living? And you're like, oh, I'm the groom of the stool, so I, uh. All the stools, I take care of those, make sure they're <laughs> stool-like. Also, first lady of the bedchamber, it sound, it starts so great, like first lady, especially like being American, we have a first lady. Could you, could you imagine like <laughs> the next presidential election, the first lady, and then someone writes, of the bedchamber, like right after that? Is that how the first lady got her name? I highly doubt it. Can we pretend it is? Sure. Okay, thanks. So, we joke, but this was a highly sought-after job um, because, the, the, you know, the the person that got to be the groom of the stool or the lady first lady of the bedchamber was a privy to a lot of royal secrets. So, not only did they get all the, the hot gossip, but also they were terrifying to other people in the court because... They knew things. Oh. Yeah. So, like, everybody in the castle's real jealous of Jerry. He gets to wipe the king's butt. We, well, we're unclear on whether he act, whether they actually did the wiping or whether they were just there, like, in case the ruler needed some help and also to make sure that the ruler had all of <sighs> its uh, necessary things for, for, for the wiping. Jerry. Jerry, I, I can't reach this spot, Jerry. <laughs> Oh, I have a especially robust tummy. Poor Jerry. I mean, good for Jerry. Yeah, I mean, good. Yeah, that was it. it this this was usually held by nobility. This this position in the kingdom. Now, what's really interesting is um, this position was first held in 1455, which you know, okay, that makes sense. But it was th- this job was not eliminated until 1901. 1901. Mm-hmm. I wish I would have looked up who the ruler in 1901 was in in England because they were the last one. They were the last one to have a royal butt wiper. The royal butt wipe. Yeah, my great-grandmother was born in 1905 and she just she just passed away recently, but rest her soul. She she was almost there. She oh, she just missed it. Aw. What a shame. What a shame. She's American also, so I'd highly doubt she'd care that much. Hey, if I was around, I would have moved over there just so I could be the royal butt wipe. I'm again, nobility. You can't you can't really just <sighs> You can't just knock on Buckingham Palace and be like, "Hey, I can wipe your butt." I'm not good enough to be a butt wipe. Nope. Oh, God. <laughs> I wish. 
So, 16th century French satire writer Francois Rabelais, in chapter 13 of his book Gargantua in Portugal, his character Gargantua investigates a great number of ways to clean one's bum. Uh, Gargantua dismissed the use of paper as ineffective. And I have a quote here. He, he says, Who his foul tail paper wipes shall at his bollocks leave some chips. So, so paper bad because it leaves chips? Is that right? Oh, uh, I, 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 you know the little balled up little pieces of paper that sometimes you can get? Yeah. I think that's what he's referring to. Mm. I, I think, isn't the... Isn't the commercial with the bears? Isn't that something that they talk about? Oh yeah, it oh, is, you don't want to. You don't want to leave. Oh man, I can't remember what they say. Leavings. We'll just call it leavings. Ooh. I don't know. Little little tiny dingleberries. Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, he he had an alternative though. Thank God. He had an alternative for paper. Paper bad. The neck of a goose that is well downed provides an optimum cleaning medium. Mm. Mm-hmm. A goose? Mm-hmm. Ooh. So, like, the, <laughs> the, I'm sure there's a fun name we could come up here with, the Royal Goose Wipe. <laughs> the Royal Goose Wipe. <laughs> Sir, I have your goose <laughs> ready for you. I want to know if it was always the same goose. Like, did he always chase down the same goose, or was it just whatever goose was lying around nearby? Well, he had to go and pick one out of the garden. Oh. You need to go and... Oh, well, that's good. They got to share the, the butt-wiping duties. Yeah. Yeah, you you go and you grab a goose from the garden, and, you know, you use it or you you take it to your royal highness. I wonder if he had a, a name for this goose. Like, if he, if he did only ever use the one goose for this purpose, was it viewed as a pet, like, oh, this is my goose, and I, he performs a job? in in the family or i don't think you'd be able to i think i think once you give them names you start feeling bad you're like well, oh. yeah i was looking more if they were used if, if they were viewed more as a tool little like, timmy honkers tool. i'm so sorry about what i'm gonna do to you maybe they liked it the geese yeah uh maybe well because like the nobility was the was the it was a it was a sought after job so maybe all the geese talked about who got to be the the neck the longest neck got to got to wipe the longest crack uh, <laughs> now i'm no expert on uh uh goose social structure but i can't that's what that pecking order is really about i can't imagine they were too pleased about the noble standing of their butt wipiness maybe it has nothing to do with the neck maybe it's more like the softness of the feathers like ooh Jasper Duck. And what's your problem, Gar- Gargantua? What was his name? Gargantua. Why can't you just pluck the geese? Why you gotta grab a goose every time? Oh, but then, like, they'd have to go through the trouble of growing back all those feathers. And that would hurt the goose. I I mean, if, I guess you have to decide what is worse, physical pain or mental anguish. Maybe just buy a nice pillow and cut it open and, you know, get some of those feathers. Or... The the colonial Americans mostly just used corn cobs. That I, sounds awful. Yeah, but at least you're not. At least the corn cob isn't alive. You're not having to chase down your corn cob. Okay. Yes. Yes. I hear you. However, if you've ever had experience with with fresh corn, you know a nice fresh cob of corn right off the bushel there, you'll notice that it's like rock hard, right? And then once you take the little corny kernels off it's spiky but that's only if you let it dry like maybe you could wet your corn cob first and then like all those little pieces will soften up Ugh! i want you to take a moment to imagine (laughs) the slimy wet cob of corn nestled between your cheeks Mm, slimy yet satisfying they probably did other things with that corn cob too oh no Anyway, let's talk about more recent toilet paper. Joseph Gaetti is widely credited with being the inventor of modern commercially available toilet paper in the U.S. In 1857, 
is is when we is when this hits hits the scene more modern looking toilet paper it was sold in flat sheets of paper close to the modern tissue boxes and each paper was watermarked with his name on it so they were wiping their butts with his name yeah joseph gaddy was all over everyone's butts so uh a few years prior to that he would have been like enemy number one of the public well it was just good advertising you know Every every tissue you pick up, you're thinking of Joseph Gaetti. Every time you're in the bathroom, Joe's on your mind. Ah, uh, that Joe. Well, time to wipe. Thanks, Joe. His advertising tagline was, The greatest necessity of the age, Gaetti's medicated paper of the water closet. Medicated paper of the water closet. Water closet. That's what I, like... I don't know. I can't even think of something that would remind me of a water closet. This is my water closet where I keep all the water. <laughs> this is my doomsday closet. I got all my water in here for fresh drinking. I'm going to last for 50 years. Now you say this paper is medicated. Um, so the, meaning aloe. There was aloe on them. Just aloe. Yeah, just aloe. They were marketed for preventing hemorrhoids. Did it do anything? No. I mean, okay, I should I should preface that with I am not a doctor, but I feel pretty confident in saying no. No, they did not prevent or get rid of your existing hemorrhoids. Just, uh, it's medicated uh, to make it nice and soft and slimy, to harken back to a simpler day when all we had was corn. <laughs> um, so, at the time, his toilet paper was, it had a hard time getting off the ground because... You gotta understand, paper was so readily available and it was free. Why am I going to spend however much money on this quote-unquote medicated pieces of square paper that has some dude's name on it whenever I can get it for free? You know, because newspapers. One of the more popular choices was the Sears catalog and the, the, the Farmer's Almanac. Sears has been around for a long time. Sears has been around for a long time. They had a good run. Haven't they, most of them, been closed down now? Yeah, I think they went bankrupt. This must be why we started using toilet paper. Big, big toilet paper. Run them out of town. <laughs> oh, darn. we got to stop selling all these Whirlpool and, and come up with something else because there's just no more marketing for my Sears catalog. Big TP done us wrong. Uh, so the farmer's almanac kind of caught on to what people were doing with their, with their product, with their their big new. What would you call it, like a magazine? Yeah. And they started pre-drilling holes because people were nailing them to the walls of their privies or their their outhouses, and so they they pre-drilled a hole so that it would be easier for people to nail them up on the wall. They knew. They knew. They marketed perfectly. Well, as long as you're doing it, might as well. Obviously, Gaiety didn't love this. This, I mean, it was it was creeping in on his business, and so he tried to convince people that the ink from these papers were toxic. And he said, "You wouldn't put ink in your mouth, so why put it on the most sensitive regions of the body?" I feel like he's almost got a point. Yeah, but I mean, I think there's several people out there have put worse in their butts. Oh no. I'm just saying. Don't bring it to that. I'm just, I'm just saying. You know, I, I, I gotta, I gotta give it to the towns folks. I probably would also use paper that's free than paper that has, you know. I'll bet at the time, uh, nobody would have taken him seriously because, like, they were doing so much worse things to their bodies in general, especially as far as uh, cleanliness and health. I think I think his idea was too forward thinking. If he would have said that today, like if somebody would have went on Twitter and was like, uh, "Charmin's actually dyeing all their paper white, and the dye is bad for you," everybody would totally believe them. Oh Lord, that's gonna get out now. We're gonna we're gonna see it trending on Twitter <laughs> that Charmin dyes their. You know, there are some toilet papers that are dyed colors. Like you remember in the seventies, you'd have like pink toilet rolls and and blue and avocado to match your avocado toilets and counters and bathtubs remember remember all that remember all those fun colors vaguely my mom still has a pink toilet 
Good for her. She updated the toilet paper. It's now white. Oh, but it's like half ply, right? Oh, gosh. Yeah, it is. Yeah, good for her. It's terrible. But, you know, old house, old pipes. Gotta have thin paper. Seth Wheeler of Albany, New York, is the patent holder of the toilet paper we know today, featuring the paper being dispensed on a roll and having perforated edges in 1891. And yes, the patent does show it being folded over. Told you. Well, it just, it does look nicer, but for people who have small children that like to go crazy in the bathroom, it's not practical. It's also way more convenient over. Under is bad. Under is objectively wrong. Come at me. I do like it over because then you can, like, make cute little folds. Like, you can make diamonds and little mountains, and I I do. It's the little things in life that bring me pleasure, and and having a a little diamond-tipped toilet rolls is think a about think luxury. about if we all kept our toilet paper on the back side a whole civilization of hotel workers would be put out of jobs who's gonna fold the triangle nobody not if i can't see it think about that uh-huh <laughs> you're really speaking to the the people that clean hotel bathrooms i'm thinking about the jobs america okay. don't let them take more of your jobs the toilet roll was popular, popularized by Scott Paper Company. Can you give any guess what Scott Paper Company is now? Um, I would like to take Scott Paper Company. Mm-hmm. Scott. Yeah. Like the brand for toilet paper. Uh, in 1879, Clarence and Edward Scott founded Scott Paper Company in Philadelphia. They manufactured toilet paper for fancy hotels as a luxury item and and drug stores as a health product. Everything was, this will heal what ails you at that time. So it was a health product. Uh, But they did this through third parties because they were embarrassed about the nature of their product. It wasn't until 1902 that Scott started manufacturing their own toilet paper under their own name. I feel like there's a lot worse things you could be manufacturing no, I mean, these people, these, we're going to get into even more how how these people just hated talking about anything that wasn't, you know, polite conversation. Because people were very reluctant to, to jump on the toilet paper wagon. People in Victorian era were very prudish and, and didn't want to discuss bodily happenings. And they certainly didn't want to be caught buying something that was for your bodily happening. Um, the invention of flushing toilets, though, was, was forcing the people to seek out other options than the newspaper and catalogs, because those bulky papers would clog the pipes. Can't flush my toilet papers. You can't, you can't flush last year's rain season. Can't Isn't flush that what your, the Fall in the Dormant is about? Isn't yeah, about yeah. It's about, like, rain seasons and I think that's the gist corn. of it. Corn. So you could just, you get the Farmer's Almanac, then you grow your corn, and then you wipe your butt with the corn that you grew from the Farmer's Almanac. Wow. So... It says it's like a it's like a perpetual motion machine. <laughs> it's unlimited power. Even though we've had what we would know as modern day toilet paper, it took a long time to refine uh, the the product. A long period of time, considering that in 1930, a selling point of Northern Tissue. What can you can you guess what Northern Tissue is now? Northern Tissue. No, oh, Quilted Northern. Yes. There, that's the one. Yep, Northern Tissue Company advertised that their toilet paper was splinter-free. 1930. Splinter-free. That was free. not that long ago. Do you realize how lucky we are to be to be having our bodily happenings in this, the year 2023, where it's always splinter-free? Not once have I ever looked at a square of toilet paper and said, hmm... That looks like that might be a splinter. Were people getting splinters? Is it, was that actually happening? It had, I mean, it had to have because why else would we advertise? I don't blame them. I'd be using a newspaper or a cob of corn too. That's awful. <laughs> what do you even do when you get a splinter there? Uh, I guess you have to get a mirror or maybe you have a significant other with, you know, gentle fingers. You'd have to hire a... A, a that's keeper what the groom of the, of the stool the groom was of for. the stool <laughs> that's why he was there uh, Jerry I got a splinter oh poor Jerry 
<laughs> Jerry, get the tweezers. In 1928, the Hoberg Paper Company tried a different approach. Um, the company introduced a brand called Charmin. 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 Mm-hmm. They started off with the name Charmin. They're still going with the name Charmin. And I think it's so beautiful because they, it's playing. They, they had it because it was playing off the word charming. And they had a feminine logo with a beautiful woman. It, it was a genius campaign by using softness and femininity. The company avoided, you know, toilet paper's real use while making the product seem luxurious. Yeah. This Charmin. paper. This charming paper is not for one's buttocks <laughs> no no icky i don't know when they switched over to the bears but they still kind of kept with that theme like they in one of their commercials i know that they say something about we know it's not proper to talk about going to the bathroom on tv it was something like that they've yeah. kept with that same same theme the bears are soft and fluffy i hope that's the reason they chose the bears because if you really think about the bears for too long you you start asking a lot of questions that that don't lead you down a good rabbit hole who are these bears who are these bears where did they come from why are they in this house why does their whole day revolve around wiping their butt you know what it it might be the bears from goldilocks you know you have a little girl who comes in and eats all your porridge and sleeps in all your beds you got to go into a protection services get set up in this house and now your life revolves around toilet paper okay see now i was thinking it might be the bears from goldilocks because uh it started as the bears complaining about the different choices of toilet paper but that's certainly a different route to take i like to i like to keep it more fun and interesting that's how i'm gonna that's how i'm gonna imagine those bears from now on when i tell that story to our children goldilocks and the three bears i'm gonna end it with and then they went on charmin commercials they had to flee the state. The end. <laughs> um, so two-ply was introduced in Britain in 1942 by Andrew Mills, and this became Andrex. Have you ever heard of Andrex? Never have I. Neither have I. It must be a British company. Maybe some of our. Maybe if we get any British listeners, they can be like, "Oh, what? I'm not going to try and do a British accent." Blimey, mate, don't be talking about meandrics like that. I, okay, that, good? that was terrible. And also, now we lost all of our British listeners. <laughs> they're gone. They, they're they like, this podcast sucks. No, they're more like, oh, blimey, mate, no, this not podcast again. sucks. Okay, we're sorry. He, In it. Stop it. Uh, they then went on to uh, first introduce moist toilet papers, like wet wipes, in mm. the 1990s, and they promoted it to be flushable. No. All right, but in 2016, some municipals had begun ed education campaigns advising not to flush because they are, in fact, I mean, they are flushable. You can get those suckers down the pipes, but boy, do you not want to. Yeah, we still need to work on our campaigning because I've seen pictures of thousands of flushable wipes clogging the sewers in like New York and stuff. It's nasty. So this is our public service announcement. Do not flush flushable wipes. Don't flush your wipes, man. No, throw those in the garbage can along with everything else like, you know, feminine products and stuff like that. Don't don't put those down your toilets. Um, it wasn't until 1970 that television networks in the USA allowed advertising under the name toilet paper rather than like bath tissue, bathroom tissue. Is that really better than toilet paper? Uh, well, you know you don't want you, know, you don't want to say the word toilet. Pe people mm. poop there. Watch out! Don't don't say that on the podcast. To like, don't say the T word. Bathroom tissue sounds like you know. Ooh, I'm gonna rub my face with this tissue while I take a bubble bath. <laughs> you see your see your buddy in the store buying some bathroom tissue and you're like whoa whoa what are you doing with that that's nasty and you're like no 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 this is my bathroom tissue for my face is that was that the philosophy i don't i don't know uh in 1973 johnny carson joked just joked on the tonight show about some comments made by a wisconsin congressman about the possibility of a toilet paper shortage and subsequently customers purchased abnormal amounts of the product and actually 
caused a, a, a shortage. That sounds familiar. Yep, because in 2020, COVID-19 did the exact same thing. There were multiple countries having um, shortage shortages with toilet paper because of panic hoarding. They're silly. In some places, though, it wasn't a big deal because of bidets and their air dryers. No, oh, smug people in their bidets. Yep, you get a little spritz up the bum. Always lording it a over us. A little blow up the bum. I mean, I guess if it's that kind of party. <laughs> Do you like to party? I got my bum dryer. Got my bum blower ready to go, locked Ooh. and loaded. Uh, so let's talk more about the problems with toilet paper because as much as we all love toilet paper, I am a avid user of toilet paper. I also do not own a bidet. I mean, what else am I supposed to use, right? Corn cobs. Corn cobs, we or a goose. Or a if goose. you've got one handy. We're gonna we're gonna start a goose farm and then start advertising goose goose necks. It is the sustainable way. Oh, we're gonna have pita all over us. <laughs> Um, seventy percent of the population doesn't even use toilet paper, as as we discussed for various reasons. <clears throat> Bidets. But Americans need thirty six point five million rolls every year. A, a twenty nineteen study said that uh, Americans use nearly three rolls per person every week, which I find just astronomically wasteful. It's me. I'm the one. I assume there's got to be like averages and then like little houses, like houses with little kids. You know how they just they just keep pulling on that roll until they have a big wad in their hand. There's got to be a lot of that going on to raise that average. <laughs> three rolls, three rolls per person every week. It's a lot. It's a lot of. It's a lot of paper. Astronomical. Uh, so let's let's really break down what that is involving. For 36.5 million rolls every year. That That is 473,587,500,000 gallons of water. Is there even that much on Earth? Uh, well, that's... It's 700,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Does that help? Do we have that many Olympic-sized swimming pools on Earth? I have no idea. Uh, it's also 253,000 tons of chlorine and 17.3 terawatts of electricity just to make... Our, our yearly supply of toilet paper, just for America. This is why we need to switch to gooses, people. Better come on down to our farm, grab yourself a goose or two. Uh, bidets. How about we just all get bidets? I mean, I guess if you want to be that kind of person. I, this is a goose-loving family. This is my official ad campaign. Don't be that kind of person. Grab a goose. No, leave the poor goose alone. They had, they served their, much like the horse, they served their time, and then inventions came along that relieved the burden that they carried. That's fine. You just go on being that kind of person. So most of the common brands are non-recyclable, which means like the pulp for the toilet paper is virgin. So they had virgin wood made into toilet paper, which meant that that, that wood had not done anything other than become toilet paper to wipe your beautiful booty and then down your toilet that's it that's all it did yes like some kind of wiccan ritual they require the wood of a virgin hmm mm-hmm yep could that be taken the wrong way in any kind of context i believe everyone just took that the wrong way Whoops. in every context um but some brands that you some some brands do use recycled paper uh maybe consider these brands next time you're at the grocery store do mother earth a a favor and buy who gives a crap that is a brand i've never seen it but it exists 365 bath tissue is another one ever springs or ever spring there's no s on the end of that seventh generation which i have heard of and trader joe's brand go trader joe's they their toilet paper is recycled huh yep they uh. use they they use a uh, recycled pulp good for them I think That's it's good. great. I I don't I don't really understand why every toilet paper doesn't use recycled pulp. I, I mean, it's isn't isn't the idea of recycled like garbage? Why would you go put forth the effort to find virgin wood <laughs> <laughs> when you've got perfectly soiled cardboard boxes? Um, wh- 
well, here's here's the thing. Are they recycling the toilet paper? Are they are they making this toilet paper out of old toilet paper? Well, no, because that goes down into That's the sewer. That's good. I was just pondering the logistics of uh, sewer diving and collecting all the used toilet paper. I don't know, but if that is... I Okay, that surely cannot exist, but if it does, isn't there a TV show that covers like dirty jobs? It would be on there. Yeah, they would know. Mike Rowe, would know. Mike Rowe, why aren't you gathering our toilet paper? <laughs> Anyway, so do you have do you have a do you have a favorite square count for when you're you're doing your thing? No, I've got a complicated relationship with toilet paper. It's usually like three three squares and then uh, another three squares because I'm I'm paranoid. Mm. I have to make sure. Yeah, that last square always needs to come back white. I yeah. agree. You have to you have to make sure that that last square is clean. Got you got the first three for the cleaning, and then the second three just to make sure. I do. I also like three squares. I think three squares is is perfect, uh, depending on the ply. If it's if it's single ply, then all bets are off. You just keep going until it's clean. Yeah, yeah. But on a on a bad day, you can always just grab a goose. Remember, folks, grab a goose. Don't be that person. Oh Lord, is that going to be our tagline? Grab a goose. Grab a goose. <laughs> Oh my god. Can't believe that's the, that's what we came up with. Nope, well, that's it. It won't be anything else. Thanks for listening to our show, everyone. I'm Ben. And I'm Danielle. Don't forget to grab a goose. <laughs> grab a goose. Nah.